Hey everyone, welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop. Today I have for you an interview that Lisa did recently over on the Growing for Market podcast. She joined host Andrew Mefford to discuss her new book, The Cut Flower Handbook. In this interview, they covered topics such as the current U.S. market demand for cut flowers, cool versus warm season flower crops, professionalism in flower farming, and succession planning concepts for continuous blooms. So here you go, and I hope you enjoy. It's the Growing for Market podcast. I think we get so caught up in thinking we have to, and I was, I went down that road. Oh my gosh, this year I have to have something new, better, different than all the other growers. You know what you need to have new and better and different from all the other growers? Be consistent, have quality and a cut at the right stage, priced to the market and show up every week. There you have it. You can grow anything and, ha- and b- grow a great flower business. And that's what this book is really about, is about growing great annual flowers, low investment, high return, which is what I'm all about, being that business girl. Hello, and welcome to the Growing for Market podcast, where we talk about growing, marketing, and the business of growing vegetables and flowers for local markets like farmers markets, CSAs, farm stands, and local wholesaling. I'm Andrew Mefford, your host and the editor of Growing for Market magazine. For 32 years, the only magazine devoted solely to flower and vegetable market farmers. I was able to read an electronic copy provided by your publisher and really good job on the book. I think it's going to be a helpful resource for a lot of flower growers. And I know how much work it is to put together a book with all the photos and images and everything in addition to the writing. So good work on that. And I've been wanting to have you on the pod for a while now, Lisa, and when I read your new book, I thought this would be a great excuse to have you on. I've been wanting to have you on because I think of people like yourself and Growing for Market founder Lynn Bazinski were really ahead of your time as far as sensing the interest in and need for information for flower growers before there was as much interest and as many resources out there as there are today. Though you took it in a different direction than a lot of the other people with Gardener's Workshop, with the online courses about growing flowers, the seeds, books, tools, and supplies. And you've also got a podcast, which I'd like to invite you to tell our listeners about. And I listened to one of the recent episodes where you talk about switching your focus from growing flowers more to Gardener's Workshop, which just seeing the way Gardener's Workshop has grown over the years, I can only imagine it's it's probably keeps you more than busy just running Gardener's Workshop. So how did you get the idea for Gardener's Workshop and how did it develop into the unique mix of what it is today over time? I mean, I can't think of any other source that has online flower growing courses, seeds, tools, and supplies like Gardener's Workshop does. Well, thanks for all of that, Andrew. I mean, when you hear somebody spill it all out, it does sound like a lot, right? But truly, it just kind of organically grew and developed. When I'm looking back now, I know that my love of business, my then discovered love of flower farming or growing and gardening, and then to discover that my greatest passion is teaching and empowering other people to actually do it, kind of just rolled up into a ball of one big old ball of wax, right? You know, so it started out me flower farming, connecting at farmers markets with groups who were like, we want your secret sauce. And I started speaking. And then when you go and speak and teach people what you're doing, then they say, where do I get that stuff? Right. <laughs> they wanted the seeds that the same seeds that I were gro- you know, was growing from and the tools that I use. And of course, soil blocking has been a major player from out of the gate. I never knew that the greatest horde of people in the world struggle to start seeds. And I do think that that really, that was really the hook, but I didn't know it was my hook back then. And so that led us down the road of where we are. And, you know, we have to remember back when I started flower farming, we barely had the internet. (laughs) I mean, literally, you know, I can remember calling England, trying to find the soil block maker, manufacturers. And you know what I mean? It was just such a different road, but I was so passionate about teaching. And then just one door opened to another. And 
started speaking. And then I got my first book offer to do Cool Flowers. And it's just kind of spiraled out of a wonderful control. And we do still grow a lot of cut flowers. We just don't sell flowers anymore. We use them for other purposes, marketing, videoing, imagery for the book, you know, and you are so right. It, I mean, you know, as well as I do, doing a book is a big project. Having to grow everything that you need to take pictures of is even harder. It's very, very difficult, but it's always really, really good when you're finished. So the Gardener's Workshop has really grown into a, an amazing educational platform. And we love everybody that works on our team. You know, we love popping out of bed in the morning and going to work because we all love farming and growing flowers or just a flower lover and helping other people actually do it is like the icing on the cake. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that that makes sense because one of the things that I learned from your new book is how you got started, which I didn't know. But that makes sense that if you're if you're doing the outreach as far as yeah going to conferences, then you one of the good things about that is it's a two way street, right? Is you can hear you hear what people are asking you, and so I can see how that probably gave you a pretty good idea of, of where the holes were in people's knowledge in what could be provided to help flower growers. So I just want to say, what do you chalk up the current surge in interest in flower growing to? I've been editing Growing for Market for eight years now. And thanks to our founder, Lynn Bozinski, we have a tradition that we still respect to this day, 33 years into Growing for Market, where we always have at least one flower specific article per magazine. And of course, a lot of the info about cultivation, fertilization, weeds, and stuff like that are equally applicable to flowers as vegetables. But we do realize that flowers are different from vegetables. And that's why we always have a flower specific article in every issue of Growing for Market magazine. But even though we have 33 years behind us here at GFM, it seems like we're getting more flower interest than ever here, which we can track just by subscriber inquiries and things like subscriptions with flower farm in the name and such like that. So Do you have any idea why there's so much interest in growing flowers right now? Well, it kind of started, I think, and by the way, I started in 1998. I kind of was like one of probably the first readers of Lynn's book, The Flower Farmer, you know, which is what launched me, you know, straight into flower farming. And so we were mighty, but few for many, many years. You know, there weren't that many, you know, as being a member of the ASCFG, I mean, you were lucky to see a couple hundred people at a conference when you went. Um, The whole membership was less than 500. And I would say in the last 10 years, we have just watched the industry just grow and grow and grow. And I think literally it's kind of a slow, it's that slow tsunami wave, you know, first off the internet, social media, all of these things have just brought everything to the forefront for us to see it. And there were more and more of us. And let's face it, flower farming is perhaps the most romanticized career in the world. And it's also the most surprising to those people when they actually get in to the ditches and start, right? But it is, I mean, I hear it every day, if not over and over again every day. Oh, I just dream of growing flowers, you know, and they literally, I mean, just, we can thank Martha Stewart. We can thank all these people, you know, Deborah Prinzing with Slow Flowers. And it's like, as the food industry started letting people know where their food was coming from. Then it started trickling to flowers and then it got more and more. But I also believe it is that romanticized growing flowers. Gardening is like the number one hobby in the world, right? To think just like I did. Why did I start flower farming? I wanted to stay home, garden, and play with my golden retrievers. You know, I mean, that was like my dream. Like you could never do that and actually make money, right? But then I found Lynn's book and the rest is history, as they say, right? But our industry is growing and there's good things about that. And there are also some challenges as there is with anything. But we are so pleased that this influx of growers has made, I mean, it's grown the ASCFG. If I'm not mistaken, I think we're at 3,000 members now. When you have 3,000 people like-minded 
in an educational organization, it gives them resources to do things we could have never done 20 years ago. I mean, all these conferences and educational resources that as a member, I can log in and go and, and learn about it. It's, it's just phenomenal. And we really experienced it in my business. And the question that we now hear often is, aren't there too many flower farmers? And as long as we're importing, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten billion dollars a year cut flowers, we're, we're selling that many a year in the United States, and we're importing eighty percent of them. I feel fairly secure in saying that I will never see the ceiling of too many flower growers. The challenge is professional, truly commercial growers that are reaching the buyers that aren't out there flooding the market, undercutting pricing, you know, because they just aren't educated. I think it's probably really easy, and I'm sure this is probably true for vegetable growers, it's easy to slide from the home gardener scene into thinking, I'll just grow more and sell them and start a business. Wow. And then they sell some and they're bitten by the bug, but they miss the rest of the story, the whole business part of the story, which in my opinion is about 75% of your business. You know, the, the flowers are 25%. Jenny Love and I had a discussion about this once. She's not even sure it's 25% because it's the rest of the business that makes you sustainable and be able to keep your business going and to be profitable, right? So that's the big challenge that we face from this huge influx, um, which I could talk you know, for a long time about that because I see it on social media. And now those of us that are professional growers face some new challenges because of the influx of uneducated and no experience yet. And they just kind of throw in the towel after a year or two, but it makes it tough for the rest of us that are in for the long haul. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel like growers need these resources that you guys are providing to take them from the dreaming stage to the staying in business stage. Because, yeah, you're right. I mean, nobody, you know what I like to say, regardless of what they're growing, nobody gets into farming because they're like business, right? But if they don't get right with the business aspect of it, they're not going to stay farming for very long. And so my outlook is is very shaped by the fact that growing for market is explicitly for flower farmers. And don't get me wrong, if there's gardeners out there listening, of course, we love have anybody who wants to subscribe or listen to the podcast. But we take a very commercial attitude, small commercial, like direct market growers, mostly farmers market CSAs, local wholesaling to florists and things like that. But we are very focused on the commercial. You know, we we think of our listenership and our readership as needing to stay in business. So it's so it's so important that there are, you know, resources like what you're putting out there to help people not temper the enthusiasm, but balance the enthusiasm with also the, the practical skills to to like, yeah, not just like come in, flood the market, undercut other growers and then dip out. They need to understand not only how to grow this stuff, but also how to run a business and be a part of that marketplace. Yeah, you know, that's so true, Andrew. And, you know, the reason I wrote this book is we needed a big picture, cut flower, growing book. You know, what the basic concepts are. And then to me, one of the biggest challenges we're facing now that we really hit home in the book is stage to harvest. When is the proper time to cut a flower? We see a lot of old flowers out there being offered. And so we spent a lot of time in the book. We show stage to harvest. There's 66 featured flowers in the book. About 40 or so are cool season. And then there's about 20 warm season. I mean, from starting it from seed, you know, right up and lots of extra information, but the stage to harvest was really huge for me because I know that that's a challenge. I sold old flowers before. It is not pretty with your customers. You know, I mean, it's not a good thing. Those that you get to keep as customers after you've done that, most often you they don't come back. Yeah. But that is something that the big picture of this book, I'm hoping it will really help 
not only new and upcoming, whether you're a home flower gardener or a budding new flower farmer, or maybe even a more seasoned grower, because I will tell you that I built my flower farm on annuals and some of those simple garden flowers, as I hear them referred to, well, we made a lot of money off those simple garden annuals. And I feel like perhaps my, I guess my claim to fame in Southeastern Virginia in the flower world is my, our pristine blooms. I grow all outdoors. I have no houses at all. I can't. I'm in the middle of the city and we're all organic. We don't even use organic pesticides and herbicides, right? Uh-huh. Our blooms are perfect. And how is that? By the way that we grow our flowers and the stage to harvest. And we grow those good old garden flowers that just sweep people off their feet. And that's what this book is really hits home and brings to people. I hope it'll revive some of the seasoned farmers that have written off some of these flowers. You know, sunflowers were huge for us, discovering how to make them a part of my business and how they literally floated a bouquet program for 10 years. You know, but most, I'll tell you what I hear oftentimes from growers, oh, well, you know, the florist can get those from the wholesaler. Well, they can get everything from a wholesaler. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's like, have you looked at the flowers that they're buying? Do you have any idea? 1,200 sunflowers a week for 26 weeks bought me a $30,000 plus John Deere in one season. That's the BB and the Astrodome to everything else we grew. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I think we get so caught up in thinking we have to, and I was, I went down that road. Oh my gosh, this year I have to have something new, better, different than all the other growers. You know what you need to have new and better and different from all the other growers? Be consistent, have quality and a cut at the right stage, priced to the market and show up every week. There you have it. You can grow anything and, ha- and b- grow a great flower business. And that's what this book is really about, is about growing great annual flowers, low investment, high return, which is what I'm all about, being that business girl. Yeah, well, that's that's a really good point. I think people are always chasing a trend, uh, yeah, thinking of what's going to be next. And then there's there's like, the, at the expense of maybe passing up the bread and butter of things like th- flowers that are always popular that, you know, year in and year out, which is a lot of what you deal with in the book. And also one of the things that I like about the book is that that I, I feel like, you know, as a vegetable grower myself, I feel like there are all these other details, tricks for flowers like harvest stage, whether like whether they need uh, preservative or not in the in the bucket, basically how to get them to market looking as the way that you want them to. And so I can't think of another place that has all those details. Like I feel like I've heard people say that they had to go. Even, there's so much information, but they have to go off and find it. Like, oh, what is the harvest stage? And you know, some of these things. Like maybe you're only starting the seed once a year, and so you forgot. Like, oh, does it need light or not? What temperature? Right, because some of the different flowers need stratification, cold temperatures, warm temperatures, you know, cold temperatures, then warm temperatures and things like that. And so that's one of the things I like about your book is it it has all those nitty gritty details in one place so that you're not sitting down, you know, doing an internet search on the day that it's to start your whatever flower and you can't remember what temperature it's supposed to be at or things like that. And I also love that I think each flower in there has a good to know section too, but just like for the, like the little details of like, you know, it's almost like the miscellaneous information that you got to know about any given flower. So I think that's what makes it is going to make it such a good resource for people. I, you know, I really wanted it to be the book when somebody walks up to me and says, I I just really want to start a cut flower garden or I want to be a flower farmer, you know, and it's like, well, you got to grow great flowers and here's the book. That's what I was kind of hoping because my other two books were very specific about cut flowers, but just one little piece of the pie. And I feel like the cut flower handbook kind of brings it all together and just really shares, you know, like for instance, I feel like a huge part of success when you're first starting out as a flower farmer, particularly as a home gardener, is your success is kind of laid out from the beginning on how large your garden is. If you start too large, I can um, I can tell you from history, we see those people get overwhelmed and fizzle out, you know, slow and low, you know, 
right? To start small and to go to organically grow. And I don't mean organically as in no pesticides. I mean, just to let it happen. I think a lot of people get it backwards. They grow a lot of flowers before they have a lot of customers. I was the other way around because of I was so focused on the business part of that. You know, in my old flower farm and school online, I really focus on the business part of flower farm. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about finding customers and how to do that. And I was always so focused on that. I never had enough flowers, Andrew. We were harvesting, you know, I'm in the middle of the city. I'm an urban farm, never had more than an acre and a half as a garden. And we were producing 15,000 stems a week in season. And we never had enough because I always had more customers. People have it backwards. They grow, they want to grow a lot of flowers starting big, then they're staring at 20 buckets of flowers and nothing to do with them. You're just a gardener with a lot of flowers till you start selling them, right? So this book really, I hope from the get-go helps people see that is the way to go. Start small and learn how to grow before you tackle and then get some customers. It doesn't talk about customers. That's the rest of the story, but it's really, really, I have found through 25, almost 26, you will, by the time this comes out, it will be 26 years of flower farming. We just see people in with a gusto. They're all about it. And then you just never see them again. The first season takes them. Yeah. Well, that's really good advice. That's what we always tell people is know where that crop is going to be sold before you even plant the seed, right? Because we always get emails from people who are like, oh, I've got all these tomatoes or I've got all these sunflowers. Do you know anybody who wants to buy them? And I'm like, oh, if you're at that point, you're probably not going to find somebody to buy them before they rot. And so I think that's really good advice if anybody's listening to this is figure out what your markets are before you grow all the flowers. So speaking of markets, I'm familiar with where you are because I am from Virginia, but one of the things people may not realize about your location in Newport News is that it is very close to Colonial Williamsburg, which calls itself the world's largest U.S. history museum due to the extensive amount of historically preserved buildings and reenactments. And it says in the Cut Flower Handbook that you were selling flowers to Colonial Williamsburg. That sounds like an interesting market. What was it? like selling flowers to Colonial Williamsburg? Did you have to grow period appropriate flowers and stuff like that? No. Yeah, it was very interesting. I learned about it from one of my florists. Our biggest market was in Williamsburg, Virginia, just because there's so much partying, right, with tourist town. And one of them, one day I had more flowers in my truck then I don't normally take unsold flowers in our van with us because everything is pre-sold. And this particular day I did, and the right guy walked out of his shop and said, what are those flowers back there? And I said, well, they're basically homeless. You know, they haven't been sold yet. And he said, all right, I'm going to tell you about something, but you have to promise not forget about us little people. I said, what in the world? Well, lo and behold, he said, let me make a phone call. And he called Clark Taggart, who was head of the floral studio. Clark just passed away last year. He was in the floral studio for like 40 years. And he said, send her over. So I went over and I had, there was right many flowers. You know, we're talking the middle of summer when is the low period. And this was a long time ago before I had big standing orders. He walked out to my truck and looked in there and he said, I'll take them all. How often can you have flowers like this? And I was just speechless. And what I learned is that tourist destinations is a really great opportunity if you happen to live somewhere because they decorate their facilities. And why they're even more perfect for flower growers than any other business they deal with or vendors is because they have to maintain their flower arrangements in those situations. You know, they, they go every week and they see how your flowers last. And so it was really a marriage made in heaven because I sold to CW for 15 years. They really took a large cut during the economic downturn. I mean, they went from buying, I had to hold back flowers off of my availability list when I would send a list to them because they'd buy everything and there's nothing left for the little people, as he called himself. (laughs) And so that was really good. And I really did not put all my eggs in one basket because you can learn the hard way, you know? So I tried to spread that love out and they were great customers, but they basically were just like every other customer. 
consistency, C, quality, great cut flowers. And they loved it even more when I had some of those great natives, you know, the Black Eyed Susans, which we grow like nine or 10 different varieties and Nigella and some of those heirloom varieties or heirloom flowers that we happen to still grow because they're great cut flowers. They had a special appreciation for it. So we didn't grow anything special. They just fell into that same category that I learned about all commercial customers. They're just looking for quality and consistency. And it was really a lot of fun working there. I mean, you know, going in there and seeing what they were doing. And because it was almost like, you know how we feel like sometimes the government doesn't have a budget, so they have no control on their spending, right? That's how I felt Colonial Williamsburg was. They didn't really have to adhere, unlike the florist that you're selling to that's paying for it as a small business owner and then has to sell it, da 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 It was a little different at Colonial Williamsburg, and those were the good years, and it was really a good gig, but it opened my eyes to things like cruise ships. Just lots, another yet market of places to sell flowers that people don't realize, but it all comes back to the same thing. You got to grow the right flowers and you got to cut them at the proper stage. And that's what I hope the cut flower handbook is just really going to make it easier for people to do that. Yeah, mm, absolutely. And I mean, that's a, that's a great tip because some people who are in a rural area who might not have a whole lot of customers around them that might have a tourist destination or something like that, that they might not have even thought of. So that's a great tip. In fact, one of the other things that I like about the book is the way that it splits the flowers into cool season and warm season crops, because it doesn't matter if one crop would go really well with another in an arrangement, if it's not possible to grow the two types at the same time. So I think it's very useful for you to group the flowers by season. I think of it like a palette of paints. There's a cool season palette and a warm season palette based on availability. And you do note in the book how, at least in your part of Virginia, June is when the cool and warm season annuals overlap and are in real great abundance. But respecting that cool warm season divide, do you have any tips for the beginning of the season with cool flowers? Right? Because everybody wants to, to have those first blooms. Do you have any tips for our listeners to get flowers going as early as possible and get, get those first blooms as early as possible? Sure. And that's a really great question because you're so right. I mean, spring is the highest demand, right? For cut flowers, spring and early summer. So cool season, hardy annuals, which is what my book Cool Flowers is about, really kind of shares the what I call the cool flower concept. Like, okay, tell me how to plant them because I couldn't figure out those cool season annuals, right? So, and for the cool flower concept, there's two planting windows and those are fall planting and then there's very early spring. And when you actually plant cool season hardy annuals is based on your winter hardiness zone and what is the winter hardiness zone of the cool season hardy annuals you are actually looking at planting, right? So it makes perfect sense. If a cool season hardy annual survives winter, in your winter hardiness zone, then that means that you can technically plant it in the fall. Why would you plant them in the fall? More abundant, more disease and pest resistant. They bloom earlier. They bloom longer. They face heat. I mean, there are so many great reasons to fall plant, if at all possible, you should. Then if it's not winter hardy in your zone, then that means very early spring planting would be your next window of opportunity, which is what we're in heading into right now. So the other piece of the ingredient that you need to know or the equation is what are your first and last expected historical frost dates? I know our weather's changing, but we have to have a jumping off point. This is internet search information. You know, it'll take a historical 10 year average and that is your first fall frost date and then your last spring. So let's just talk about very early spring planting. So for on general, very early spring planting is planting transplants in the field out six to eight weeks before your last spring frost. For me, I'm mid-April last frost. That means Valentine's Day we're out there planting cool season hardy annuals. Oftentimes there's snow on our beds. We sweep because the, these beds are all prepared in fall typically because usually it's 
frozen, wet, and cold at that time of the year. But we ready the beds in fall, so we just walk out there and plunk them in the ground. And this is particularly useful for people in very northern regions. Not that you can get them in the ground the full six to eight weeks like most of us can that are in the lower half of the U.S., but you can still get this group of flowers or plants in the ground weeks earlier than you can plant warm season tender annuals. So we have people up in the northern necks of Canada that are just really trying to make the most of cool season hardy annuals. You know, it's like, okay, now I got the concept. These things will take frost. They'll take cold. They might not take three feet of snow load all winter, but at the end of my winter, if I make provisions of a place to plant these guys, they will bloom so much earlier than otherwise. So the moral of the story is, is if a cool season hardy annual is winter hardy in your zone, and if, it's hard information to learn, by the way. I mean, we had to research and research mostly old books to find out that information and then my own personal experience. But on our website, on the seeds, we try to put that information, what's known to us. So that's another resource of uh, where you can learn that piece of information. But the benefits of getting cool season hardy annuals in the ground as early as possible, whether that be fall or very early spring, the benefits are large. They bloom earlier, they bloom more, the stems are twice as tall usually. You get more stems, they're more disease and pest resistant. Once you do it, you cannot believe you haven't been doing it your entire career. It's literally that life-changing, and they bloom during the highest demand season. And we have growers now that are only growing cool season hardy annuals because of cool flowers. They like stopped in the summer when the, their, their particular markets dropped off. So it's, it's pretty amazing. It's worth figuring out. And the Cut Flower Handbook really, I hope, is really helping people figure out when is my planting time. You know, it has the steps that you follow and it even has blocks you can fill out. When is my frost dates? When are my planting windows? Because once you have those, you have everything. You've got the lion by the tail at that point. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really good point. People can can use that as a planning guide because they did. I know the USDA just updated hardiness zones based on the way the weather is changing. And so that should be a good resource for people to get some numbers to plug into your charts and things so people can figure out when to plant. And I think that's a really good tip to plant anything in the fall that you can. But even if you can't, like, up, you know, I'm up here in Maine. And so there's there's a lot of even cool season stuff that would not survive the winter without a lot of protection up here. But, you know, one thing I definitely didn't do when we were starting out that we've done more and more over the years is to prep beds in the fall. Because then, you know, in our case, it's snow cover. But, you know, in our case, then as soon as you get the snow to recede, you can go plant, right? Because, a lot, you know, a lot of times, at least for us, we're dealing with saturated soils that aren't so good to prepare, right? And so if we don't prepare them the previous fall, then we're, 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 you know, kind of twiddling our thumbs, waiting for it to dry out and stuff like that. So just that idea of either planting in the fall where you can, or prepping the beds in the fall where you can't plant in the fall is just, is a, is a great tip. So we've heard some really great tips from Northern growers like you on how once they've, all they have to do is have one crop do well getting it in the ground early. And then they're like lit on fire, right? And so they do things like prep their beds in the fall, put silage tarp in. I mean, it's finished prepped. You know, it's got whatever mulch. It's like it's ready to be planted. Then they silage tarp it. Then when they have snow in, you know, very early spring, they put another silage tarp on top of the snow to help melt the snow quicker and the combination of being able to pull that lower silage tarp back with loosened soil just gets them. I mean, it's like contests now of people getting stuff in the ground because the plants can take it. It's getting them in the ground into that cold to cool soil and they just hit the ground running. Yeah, absolutely. That is a great tip. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was making that the transition from cool season annuals to warm season yeah like i mentioned you know there's this point i guess for you it's around june where 
you've got the cool flowers maybe on their way out and the warm season flowers on the way in. I was thinking that can be kind of a tricky thing to plan for to make sure that you've got enough, but not too much, right? Because of, of course, if you have excess blooms, it's essentially wasted opportunity, right? Because you, you put the energy into growing those things. And like we were talking about, if you don't have a market, if you can't match up supply to demand, having too many blooms can sound like a good problem to have, uh, except when they go unsold. Yeah. And it's, it's especially tricky because you never know what the weather's going to be doing, right? You could have an early summer could come on early and kick the cool flowers uh, before the, the warm season a- annuals have really had time to develop. So what I'm wondering is how do you plan for that abundance when the cool flowers are going out, the warm season flowers are coming in? Do you have strategies for planning a transition from cool flowers to warm season flowers or just any tips on making that transition from cool to warm season? Sure. So we never really planned for the transition. We planned to have the maximum amount of blooms because, you know, that is the high season. I mean, literally you can, I mean, Mother's Day, we never would make, Easter is iffy, you know, because I'm a field grower, you know, we're Uh outside in a garden. But the plan that I always had, I'm a huge succession planter. You know, I mean, that's the secret to our success is we succession plan, which also the cut flower handbook really, it gives you a two year diagram to watch how that actually can work for you. And so we always just maximize our succession planting and we take it when it comes. Unlike folks that might be planning for events and things, I never took any part in that. We always planted the maximum for the space that I have for the successions that needed to be planted and then had enough customers to catch them all when they came. And when that transition happens from cool season, hardy annuals, which for us here in the field, it's pushing it to say it starts at at the end of March, but it's usually about April when we start getting trinkles of flowers. We can't start our bouquet programs, but our florists were hungry. We sold to 23 florists and they would take anything. They didn't care what it was. You know, they were, as they said, they were ready for the real flowers to come back, you know, after going through a long winter of no local flowers. So we have that transition of waiting for volume to come where all the cool flowers, the cool season hardy annuals really get ramped up. And then we always implemented early bird sunflowers. You know, we always have sunflowers for Mother's Day, growing them outside in the field even because they become our focal flowers. And then when the warm stuff comes on, you are so right that you can quickly become overwhelmed. I mean, You're dying harvesting flowers here in late May and into June. But I will share a tip that we've discovered in the last two years of never composting any more flowers that aren't sold. Because, you know, I mentioned earlier that while we don't sell flowers anymore, we use them for our, you know, live shopping show and for marketing, for books, taking pictures of books and videoing and stuff. And we give away, we have a big gifting program where we give police officers and, you know, we go in and give the whole station bouquets to take home, right? But we still have a lot of flowers. And if anyone that is going to see a blip of this, what's behind me are all dried flowers. I never dried a flower until two years ago. And I learned from Ellen Frost, who is a designer that only uses locally sourced flowers, that because she's trying to prevent shrinkage, you know, that that the amount that you throw away each week of a fresh product, right? They dry everything. It doesn't matter if anybody says it's a good dried flower or not. They hang everything to dry because then in the month of November, guess what their cash flow is? Making dried wreaths. I mean, we did not compost any stems this year. Because they're all behind. We create backdrops is what we're doing now with it for videoing and for all these lives that I do. But as a flower farmer, especially in the beginning, we don't do any special handling. They just hang to dry and then we find something to do with them. And so there never has to be another wasted flower. So drying those flowers. So we now look forward to that abundance. And again, we just always, I work so hard to have more customers then I had flowers. That's the true solution to not figure out what to do with leftover flowers. The solution is 
to find more customers, which I find to be the biggest challenge for folks. So the transition is welcomed whenever it decides to happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you mentioned about the flowers behind you, because honestly, I thought that was like a blue screen with the flowers behind you or something. So that's cool to know. It's those really re- flowers. Real live dried flowers. Okay. Yeah. Tell me what your drying setup is like or, or what you can recommend, because I know I've heard about a lot of different setups and there are a, a lot of similarities, but there's always some differences too. I always just like to hear what, what do you recommend for people as far as getting their flowers dried and keeping the color good? Sure. So, well, ours is like the simplest. And I learned again that from Ellen, you know, because it's all about the profit margin, right? You've already spent, she's already spent money on flowers. She doesn't want to invest another dime. And so in her studio, that's what I do. I'm doing the same thing she does. I'm in this building, my work building, which is conditioned. It's heated and air conditioned. And we literally just put chains from wall to wall and got a bunch of hooks And we just rubber band and hang them up there. And I mean, the lights are on in here during the day, but generally it stays between 68 and 72 in here year round and it's dry and we just leave them to hang. And as you can see, I mean, there are some that don't hold their color very well. I mean, we found some that are just dogs. They just don't do well. You know, like Xenia's kind of mush, but I will say 90% of them dry beautifully. Some of the surprise, the sleeping wolves, you know, Bupleurum. Who knew that Bupleurum would be one of the most in-demand dried flowers? It's also the in-demand fresh. But anyway, so it's been a really great journey and I have no interest in making wreaths. But if I was still selling and I did farmer's markets for 14 years and they always had fall markets they want you to be a part of, why not? pull out your dried leftovers. Nobody needs to know they're the leftovers, right? And make a added value product out of it. So yeah, the dried flower thing is is a really big hit for us. And then for me and what, what my business does, we love having these dried flowers to use on our live shopping show all winter when I don't have fresh flowers. So, you know, it's just a world of opportunities, Andrew, as you can see. I just think there's endless opportunities in business for flower farming as a professional grower. There's no end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a great tip. And hopefully that gives growers the confidence to plant as much as they think they need for markets. You know, one thing that reminds me of is we used to work for another grower and so who grew a lot of culinary herbs. And so... The, the saying everybody says in farmer's markets about pile it high and watch it fly. And so what that grower did is she she would deliberately overplant and over harvest what she thought she would sell on, on all the culinary herbs. A, so her display looked nice, you know, it was nice piled up, right? Because nobody, if, if even if you think you're only going to sell six bunches of cilantro or something, uh, you know, the pile doesn't look that impressive. And so the other thing is that if she ended up having a really good day at market and whatever culinary herb was really popular, then she would have the supply to sell it. But the whole plan was to overplant, over harvest, and then she had a drying room. And so it's kind of like what the flowers is that and hers got garbled or you know cr- cr- right i think garbling is the right word for crushing up the herbs and things like that so of course when with the flowers you'd be trying to keep them as nice as possible but it's those ideas of how to deal with oversupplied product and they also you know have something to sell year round because then of course the farmer that we worked for when it was too cold to grow culinary herbs then she had all the dried so that's a great tip for how to not let flowers go to waste. And you know, Andrew, um, that's another flower confetti for weddings. I mean, to crumple up these flowers, that's yet another market. You know, there's just endless possibilities. And you know, when I would teach people like to start the sunflower successions, it's like, I don't care if you don't think you can sell them. If you're selling at farmer's markets, three or four buckets of sunflowers will draw people into your booth. Consider it marketing, you know, that expense, but you will end up selling them. But it's like, we have to, you know, that mentality of, I get that question a lot. Well, how will I know how many stems a plant's going to produce? So I know how many I'm going to 
you know, have. It's like, I never thought about that. I figured out how much growing space I had, broke it into six sessions, planted it to the max and went for it. You know, I think we have a, a lot of folks that are really stuck in planning and then they're worried about their growing too much. You know, Dave Dowling, who is, you know, the just a leader in our industry. He's like, we call him the walking encyclopedia. Dave said, if you aren't bringing home 20% flowers from the farmer's market, you did not grow enough. You have to have abundance. You have no customer wants to walk in your booth and buy the last flower. (laughs) You know, that's not a good experience. It's just not. And so, you know, I just tend to think big, you know, if you can't figure that out yet, right? But I always <laughs> wanted to have more and more to have a bunch because it does draw, it drew me in to booths and it's just do what works for you. And when I say that, I don't mean what works for you in your business, what works for you as a shopper, you mm-hmm. know, nobody wants to walk into a booth with somebody looking at a phone, right? They want to walk into a booth of beautiful flowers that, you know, are harvested at the right stage and just really hoping that this book will really help a lot of people be able to master that. Um, because I understand it is a hard learning curve. Yeah, it, it can be when you've invested in, you know, the tools, supplies, fertilizer and all, the, all that kind of stuff. And you need to start it to start making money. Well, I mean, on that tip, do you have any either mistakes you see beginners making with the warm season flowers or even tips that more advanced growers could benefit on with the warm season crops? I think I've I've touched on it already, but to underestimate the power of simple garden flowers, because those, in fact, are the flowers that touch people. You know, they're like, where do we hear so often? Oh, my gosh my mom grew those or my grandma had those or, and you know, when, when our zinnias, um, zinnias, you say that word and people are like, Oh my gosh, I love zinnias. It's the number one seed we sell. And it was in the top 10 of the cut flowers we sold all my entire career. But we tend to think because they might be easy to grow in our environment, especially as you get more experienced and you know which ones to grow and how to master all that, you feel like you couldn't possibly sell that many. But I can tell you that after 25 years, the same retail customers showed up. We had an on-farm market, private market. And You know, I sold to the same 150 people for years. And guess what? They bought the same flowers week after week, after week, after week, after year, after year. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and I had trouble too, grasping all that, but it goes back to the same old thing, consistency and quality. And people will take it. I'm not saying that we didn't love having, oh my gosh, look, the hydrangeas are, hydrangeas are in or the peonies are in or, you know, having those pop in and out special things. The lizzies are blooming. But the, the staple flowers, which is what the Cut Flower Handbook is really all about, were the meat and potatoes. And I think that it touches people. We had florists that when the zinnia started, they canceled all their standing orders of Gerber's, Gerber daisies that would automatically be shipped to them because their customers loved them. They found a way to manage around the fact that they don't go in coolers. But I think underestimating the power of simple annuals, we all face that, whether you're seasoned. I mean, sunflowers is just another, I mean, oh my gosh, sunflowers. Sunflowers are cash cows, literally cash cows when you do them right. And, you know, interestingly enough, during the high production years, when we were planting 1,200 stems a week for 26 weeks, which if that were today, it would actually be 32 weeks. We've stretched it out so much. But I only grew one color of one sunflower and sold that basic orange, pro-cut orange, which I've grown Horizon now. They didn't have it then. The same sunflower week after week. You don't have to grow a bunch of different colors. Again, it's the quality and consistency. So don't underestimate. And I also find that seasoned growers just have that assumption that cool flower concept won't work for them. You know, I mean, there's like, oh, well, I live like I live in Maine. That what won't work. Well, you might not be able to fall plant, but I'm here to tell you from hearing from lots of northern growers, they are reaping blooms weeks earlier than they ever did. So I think we get stuck in our little, I do too, in between the lines to like open up and, and feel growing them too. You know, you don't have to you put them in a house. Why waste that expensive space? 
Right. Because that's the most expensive space on the farm. Definitely. You want to make the most of, of, you know, whatever's going in and coming out of the, of a hoop house or greenhouse. So the idea is that then growers transition back to the cool flowers for fall to end the season. Do you have any tips? Is it just looking at frost dates once again and just figuring out when you need to plant those cool flowers? Because I also know part of the reason that a lot of the flowers that are cool, they they also don't like the heat. You know, they're not a lot of them wouldn't work out if you planted them in the middle of summer. So I feel like there must be some trick as far as waiting long enough that it cools off enough, but not waiting so long that they can't mature given the length of your season. Exactly. So there are a couple of, well, there's, you know, ornamental kale that we grow as a cut flower that is intended to be grown in the fall. And it, that's it. That's covered in the book. And you can actually, there are some cool season hardy annuals that are beneficial to actually get them started in the summer and get them, you know, you have to do the equation, which it actually shares in the succession portion of the book on how to do this. But I only recommend people really try to have cool flowers in the fall after they have got a lot of experience under their belt. Because I'll tell you what we, our succession plan was or is, is that we continue to succession plant warm season tender annuals as late as possible, but we transition into fall colors for those last, that last planting. Oh, right. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. You know, you know what I mean? It's like we, it, that's easier to grow. And then after you get a little experiment, yeah, it would be great to have snaps and some sweet William and some of the other cool season hardy annuals that actually, you know, can, might take you right up to Thanksgiving. But I think that really flexing those muscles of learning how to succession plant and thinking, when is this flower going to bloom that I'm planting today? Oh, in October or late September, maybe I ought to think orange and red, not pink. And that's kind of what we have followed all these years. And I talk about that in the book. It's just so much simpler than we think, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated. Right, right. Okay. So not having to do the whole transition, just changing your colors. Because that's one thing that Dave Dowling, when we had him on the pod, I know we were talking about growing flowers for every season. And, you know, I don't know it because I'm not a flower grower, but he knew he was exactly like, you know, orange for Thanksgiving. But then, you know, you don't want the orange to be too late because then people have moved on to red and white for the Christmas and the the winter holidays and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, I think that'll save growers some work right there from having to transition back to cool crops, you know, just just plant different colors. Yeah. And it's because it's a challenge to get seed started, as you mentioned, and the heat. I mean, you just have to, and you can do it, but I'm saying that's graduate work. If you're in elementary school still, just stick with the, it's simple, you know, it's just business is complicated enough. Flower farming, growing is complicated enough. Keep it simple. That's where the profit grows the most. That's such good advice. As you know, I think we've already talked about a little bit how uh, exotics get a lot of attention. Understandably so, people are always looking for something new, but you know, I think it's people have to remember that the, the majority of their income is probably going to come from some really solid workhorses r- rather than some new thing they discovered. And, you know, like, I mean, I think most farmers and, and gardeners like love to plant something new. So I'm not totally I'm not poo pooing just novelty because it, it's fun. I mean, it's it, 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 whether it's a different color of something that you've grown for a long time or a whole new crop. I mean, you know, it's it's irresistible to see new varieties in the seed catalog and not not like, oh, I'll try a little packet of that, you know, and see how it goes. And that's great. That's how we, we find new things. But it's like w- what I would tell growers with anything is don't plant a huge amount of anything before you've had a chance. Right. to test it out you know do a test whatever amount is meaningful you for you you know a few plants if you're really small do a test bed if you're bigger or whatever but yeah you know everything looks great in the seed catalog just you know make sure and, and test it out you know before going whole hog on anything and just the reality of it is that that you know the majority of your profit is probably going to come from you know similar or the same crops year to year like you were saying because they're people always want them perennially popular 
So, and it's easy to sell over and over again <laughs> to the same old customers. And I wanted to just add, I mean, we're always testing. I have some new cool flowers. They're not new plants. They're new to the cool flower concept out in the garden going. So, you know, if, but I would have never done that when I was in high production. You know, you just don't have time or the space, right? So, you know, I'm just really big in, you know, if you're going to be in business, do your business because <laughs> it sidetracks people. It derails them, it, the failure and the money spent and wasted. And But hopefully this book will really encourage and provide what they need to actually do it. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of those crops that, that we grow year to year, I know a lot of growers have favorite combinations or recipes for bouquets and arrangements. Do you have any cool season arrangements, combinations that you really love from over the years? The, the saying around here is my favorite flower is the one that's harvested and in the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and that is truly true because I love the one I'm with. You know what I mean? It's like, I'll, I'll look at a bucket of flowers and think, oh my gosh, have you ever seen anything more beautiful till I turn around and see the next bucket? So, but our motto has always been, you know, we did a big bouquet program for supermarkets as well as bouquet subscriptions. And then of course our on-farm private market. Mm -hmm. And so we made a lot of bouquets through the years and people are often asking, what was your recipes? We didn't really have a recipe. I think this surprises people. We, as again, I just planted out the annuals that grew really well for us, that gave us diversity so I could grow them simply in the space that I had. And then my sister, who was the head bouquet maker, I mean, in her opinion, everything, all flowers go together. You know what I mean? It's like all colors are natural and they go together. Surely there were some favorites. You know, some weeks we'd go, good gracious, they're beautiful this week. But guess what? We'd say the same thing next week. But I will tell you the probably the biggest benefit that we found in making bouquets is when we started growing sunflowers to float our bouquet program. And what I mean by that is, is that, you can have all the other ingredients, but if you don't have a couple, three, at least focal flowers that people are really drawn to in a bouquet, they just kind of look blah. Well, sunflowers would be that flower. And when you grow them small, like we grow them, it just revolutionized everything. Literally, that's what we, I can remember making three or 400 bouquets on a Friday afternoon. And it's like, where would we be without sunflowers? Dead is where we'd be. <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't be able to do what we were doing. And so just having a volume of flowers and making sure you have something which for us was always sunflowers to do what you've got to do. And then they were the icing on the cake to commercial customers. All right. So once again, yeah, re rely on the old reliables. Yeah. I mean, is that not how simple good business is? I mean, I'm learning that more and more being in business. <clears throat> simple is king. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, a absolutely. I think I think a lot of us, myself included, you know, get ourselves in trouble by by making things more complicated than they need to be. I don't know why that. I guess it's just a human tendency, but it doesn't have to be more complicated than it needs to be. And I'm really good at that too, Andrew. I have a team now that will look at me and say, "No way are we doing that. Do you have any idea what that means? We have to do this, 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 and this." And yeah, so I I still do it. I just have somebody to keep me in check actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. One of the other things that I like about the Cut Flower Handbook is that it has extensive notes on the flower crops you highlight for each season, things like favorite varieties, harvest stage, how to store them, and you have a good to know section for each flower for those other little details that might not fit into another category, which I thought was great because I can't think of another resource that has all those details in one place. I feel like you've assembled all the details that people search the internet for in one place, which is probably worth the price of the book by itself. I feel like those harvest details are so important because it doesn't matter how beautiful the flower was when you harvested it, if you harvested it at the wrong stage or stored it wrong and it looks bad by the time you go to sell. Or it doesn't have vase life. And like you said, you know, vase life is going to bring you repeat customers when people are like, oh, wow, those, those flowers lasted all week long. Got to get some more of those. I just want to ask you quickly, what 
tips. So there's the specific tips relating to each crop in the book, but what are the tips you can give people on harvest and storage of flowers so that they look their best by the time they get to the customers more generally? Sure. And so for every flower you grow, you need to learn what it's harvest stage is because it's different for most some need to be fully wide open like coxcomb sunflowers pretty much almost closed it's different for each one and knowing that stage really helps you to prevent pest damage and i mean the whole sort of things even beyond how long they last in the vase so you know i mean i had somebody look at me one day at a conference and and i said yeah you have to know i mean it's like i i've been doing it so long now i look at every flower and it's like i instantly know oh that's too old or that's you know not ready cut whatever she said i have to know that for every flower i grow and it's like yeah This is your business, right? That's part of your stellar skills. This is what starts separating people, Andrew. What I really find, it's like they don't understand how important this stuff really, really is. And so really knowing the stage to harvest and we use conditioning products because we've learned it makes a difference. I mean, I spend a lot of money on conditioning products and it does make a difference and that's also covered in the book on the steps that we follow and it makes a really big difference particularly for the dirty dozen those flowers that pollute the water more than other flowers and they're even more susceptible to the pollution right yeah so learning the steps and once you know it it's forever you know that's what really makes a really big difference and then when your customer gets the flowers home because you know we find that particularly flowers that continue to open after you cut them those are the ones that we cut fairly close customers love watching their bouquets change you know like sunflowers that continue to open and harvesting at the right stage and providing the proper products in your bucket as well as to send home with the customer keeps that process going and people are like i mean especially i mean and i am an old person now you know i'm 62 but it's like old people thinking about my in-laws that's what i would hear from them we just love coming out in the morning and looking at the bouquet and it's changed and that's because the flowers were cut at the proper stage so it's bigger than we think yeah All right. That's good. So there you've got the general advice from Lisa. Get a hold of a copy of her book and you can get the specific advice on when and the conditioners. is That's what you're calling what you put in the water, right? To the floral floral preservative. Okay. I just want to make sure if people were listening uh, and weren't used to that conditioners for the the what goes in the water you know things that they keep basically it's basically something you put in the water to keep the flowers looking good right well it kills bacteria and keeps them fed yes yes right yeah okay so that can be an important factor too so all right well Lisa, you've been very generous with your time. We've already been talking for quite a while now, but I I did want to make sure and just loop back and see if there's anything else that I should have asked you about or anything else you'd like to tell us about while we've got you. You know, I just want to say that it is so much simpler than what we think to grow great quality cut flowers. And hopefully that's what the cut flower handbook will just make that really doable for folks. But for flower farmers out there that are just wanting to get started or are getting started, just don't underestimate the power of quality and consistency. And that's what this book will really drive home through success, through first off, selecting what to grow and then succession planting and knowing when to plant it all, which it takes you by the hand and walks you through that. And then, you know, as you've already alluded to, I mean, that stage to harvest so that the end customer or your commercial customer that is in the hole, you know, that's kind of the middleman to your flowers, that is just a really good end product for them because that's how we're taking the domestic markets back is through quality flowers and it is the most important thing for the end customer but you have to grow the right thing plant it and cut it at the right time yeah very true and uh yeah that's as you mentioned uh, something like 80 percent of the flowers are, are trucked or flown in from from outside of the country and and that can seem pretty daunting on the other hand you can flip it around and think about that's all market share that if that local growers can take there's this huge market for flowers right now is being fulfilled 80 percent by imports it's like yeah if, if growers do a good job 
you know, hunt down their customers, keep the flowers looking good, harvest them at the right stage. You know, that's that's 80% of the market that, that local growers can take. So it's true. I see no end in sight. Yeah. I, well, I'm just, yeah, I'm excited just seeing all the interest in, in you know, growth in flower farms. I'm, I'm very positive about the outlook for, uh, for domestic flowers here. I appreciate your, you know, all the great resources that you have that are helping people with that. But so I do want to ask, where can people find you online or on social media or wherever people want to track you down? Sure. So um, kind of home base for us is thegardenersworkshop.com. You will find our fully stocked garden shop. Our kind of niche is that we only sell the tools, seeds, and supplies that I actually use. Um, That's kind of how, what we draw from, stuff that we really want to use. We have a fully stocked online course library, and all of our courses are now on demand, which means they can be purchased 24-7. And you can also connect. We have a QVC type shopping show that happens on Fridays, which is really was brought about so we can highlight our harvest as we're harvesting and show the flowers in season, which you can connect with us over there. On, I'm very active on social media, on all the, you know, the given platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, the Gardener's Workshop Farm is where you'll find us. And we just, you know, we just really... This whole farm has now become an educational platform. It's been transitioned the last two years to go from high production to just really offering to folks what really helps them. And we're very in tune to that. And we just love offering the courses and our school courses have private groups where we can communicate and help folks. And that's just really what drives the whole ball of wax around here. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for the book. I enjoyed it. Thank you for all the resources and thank you for your time to be with us today. I think I really enjoyed the conversation and you know, you're so involved in all this. I was thinking uh, you're the the kind of person who might come back and visit us again. Tell us about one of your other projects, one of these days on the pod, but thank you for today. And and maybe we'll hear you from you again in the future sometime. Sure. I'd love to anytime, Andrew. It's been my pleasure and thanks for asking me. All right. Take care and we'll, uh, we'll hear from you in the future. Ciao. Okay, welcome back. So if you'd like to listen to the full original episode over on the Growing for Market website, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. You'll find links in the show notes to other topics as well, including Lisa's new book, The Cut Flower Handbook. So that's all for today, flower friends. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm-hmm.